about your experience with fans over the years, especially as such a horror icon? Um, you know, horror fans are very uh, peculiar but loving, passionate group of people. They live, breathe, and eat horror. Um, in the early years, I used to be a little afraid of being pigeonholed into just horror because my body of work, you know, started with Platoon, my very first film, and it ends with Zoom on The Flash. You know, you can't quite pigeonhole me. But it's important, I think, for all artists to get out to different cons where they can interact, I mean, truly interact with their fans. Fans aren't just a parcel for commerce. I mean, we already get paid when we do the projects. The people that you touch and affect are the ones that are going to remember you forever. At this con, my two favorites, you know, besides you, of course, and teaching me how to boomerang, but there's two little girls. One was named Emily, a young little precious thing, about 11 years old, who was just such a sweetheart. Because she was the biggest fan of a project I did last year called Dead of Summer, for Freeform, which got canceled, unfortunately, but she loved it. And I made sure that I dug out a photo for her uh, that we don't put on the table. And when I gave it to her, she started crying. Another one was named Sarah, who wants to be a theater artist. And that's what, how I started, and I was around her age when she started. I told her that I had a special treat for her. I subscribed to American Theater Magazine, which comes out bi-monthly. And it's a listing of all the schools they have in the country, all the theater productions that are listed, and advertisers for some of the best schools to go study. When I gave it to her, you may have seen it on my Instagram page. Her little eyes just lit up. She looked to the sky. And for her, it was like Christmas, you know. And those are the moments that reach me the most and touch me the most. And I've had, you know, special needs people that have a difficulty communicating, but somehow they're able to come up and kind of tell you in either words or emotionalism how much our work has affected their existence. That's what matters in these things. For me. Does that ever get like difficult where people are telling you about their, you know, their life history? Is that sometimes hard? Because you don't no, because I'm an empath. Uh, you know, my daughter's a healer. She's more of a healer than me. I she went to Wesleyan and then she went to Columbia, which are two great film schools. And when she first started, she never went to a single film class. I was initially a little hurt, but I realized that maybe part of her experience was that. Uh, dad was sometime would go off, you know, for two or three months at a time. And I understood that, but it allowed her to go to the both of those schools. So she decided to become an occupational therapist. And she's working with preschoolers who are autistic, helping them transist into the world of, of education. And that's much more emphatic than I could ever be. But I know where she got it from. Because Armin also mentioned, and as did Ken and Tori, um, they both talked about how their work um, is very similar to therapy in some ways because of the way you have to connect with people when you're acting. Right. So, well, it is. And it's not only therapeutic, I think, for the people that, we, that like our work, but it's therapeutic for us. I know that theater and a life in the arts certainly saved my life. You know, I was raised by a single person, my aunt, who was my main inspiration. Every summer, she would make sure that I was involved in a different project. That wasn't necessarily always artistic. I mean, everything from the Boy Scouts. One year, she sent me to a science museum. She just gave me a broad range of exposure, A, to keep me, you know, about a father figure around, make sure that I was occupied, so I never joined a gang or ever got seduced into a life of crime. And, you know, I give everything I do to her. Rest in peace, Aunt Clara. I love you to pieces. That's lovely. <laughs> so, um, do you see more women fans of horror, or have you worked with any women directors of horror? I've worked with, I've worked with two, you know, I'm doing a current show called Room 104 on HBO, and I worked with this brilliant young directress named, um, Sarah Dina Smith. She's an up and coming person that's going to be make quite a mark on this world. Um, and then I worked out in the Miami area. I worked with a Latina woman named Lou Simon. We did a project called Agoraphobia together. So I think there's more and more opportunity. You know, um, the movie that's coming out or next week, Detroit, 
which was directed by the woman who did Hurt Locker, and uh, uh, there's more. And then, of course, the woman that directed Wonder Woman, which you know did as well, if not better, than a lot of these action films that are out. So for everyone that succeeds, I think there's more opportunity to open. And as an African American man, you know, when I was a kid, there wasn't many of us represented on screen. But I sought out and watched everyone I could because life, this is a diverse world. And the more you see yourself, the more empowered you become. Yeah, we absolutely need more representation. Yeah, it's a big conversation in fandom now. Yes, diversity. And I think, you know, it, it helps. And you see all the little kids at the con now. Oh, it's and great. And they're dressed as, you know, superheroes. And, yeah. You know. And they can be, you can be a, a superman of color. Yeah. You can be whatever you want. You can, it's, when I was a kid, I used to think I was Batman. You know, who knew? Oh, you'd be an awesome <laughs> Batman. <laughs> yeah, well. Oh, my God. I, I would love you chance. as Batman. <laughs> yeah, me too. But that was my favorite, favorite character. I also like Green Lantern. Uh, you know, and, and another thing for cons that I get is that I get to meet, I love meeting the artists that started it all. You know, Comic Con started with the guys that drew and wrote in sweatshops. And they always put them at the back of the room in Artist Alley, but they were the ones that, you know, created this. And also Star Trek. Star Trek, the very first con I went to was a Star Trek convention. So you went as a fan, you were a fan. No, no, nope. I did. I never went to a convention as a fan, but being here as I am, I always go and say hello to my favorite artists. You know, a lot of them get ignored by some of the people Absolutely. that shouldn't ignore them. So you yeah. got to tell people while they're here that you appreciate them. Yeah, no, those artists are amazing. I yeah. mean, this wouldn't exist, this whole culture None wouldn't of it. exist. Without None of it. Them. We lost George Romero recently, right? And uh, without him, the... The world of zombies, as we know it now, wouldn't even exist. And I think some people lose track of that. But he was a brilliant, gifted, generous. People ask me, what were your impressions of him? He was on the set every day of Night Living Dead, the remake. And every time I finished the scene, he just had the biggest smile on his face. Uh, and that communicated a lot to me as whether I was doing a good job. He was great. I met him once at one of the hard times. And he was so generous and mm -hmm. humble about his, you know, immense influence. Contribution. Yeah. I was really struck by that. Then. Yeah. Well, you know, when they did the original, they didn't copyright it. So they didn't really make any money. And that the movie was shown so many venues and they never got a dime. So one of the reasons they did the remake I did was that they would own and get some money back. And uh, hopefully they did. And... Uh, you know, but his reputation supersedes everything else. So any final things you'd like to say about, you know, what you do or...? Uh, I use the word with an acting teacher uh, that uses this term, God conscious art. So, you know, it's one thing to be a celebrity and um, not be a genuine person. There's another thing to be a person that's committed to accepting that whether, whoever you believe in, whatever that is, you know, knowing that our what we do is a gift, and not everybody is chosen. But if you are chosen, it's a gift, and everything you do, whether it's directly through your work, or doing theater, or doing community projects, or rescuing cats, or counseling kids, being a big brother, it all comes because we are supposed to give back, not because we think it's politically correct, but because it's absolutely essential. We all need each other in order to keep the society safe for ourselves and for future generations. Awesome troubled girl. <laughs> thank you. Awesome, and thank you.